go. I don't know if you can hear me. Maybe a little knock from everyone. Yes. Uh, so hello and welcome to the second live debate organized by the Institute for International Peace and Armed Conflict, Institute für Friedenssicherung und Humanitäres Völkerrecht, IFHB and Verfassungsblock. Pierre Thielberger, the executive director of IF, IFHB and Max Steinbeis, founder of Verfassungsblock, are bringing together international recognized experts in a three-part online discussion series to reflect the unprecedented constitutional challenges the COVID-19 pandemic poses to states worldwide, worldwide and ways to address them. My name is Cynthia Wyszewski and I'm an editor at Verfassungsblock. After last week's focus on German constitutional law and politics, today we want to focus on the European side of things. Whatever it takes, COVID-19 is an existential crisis for the European Union. Yesterday's announcement by Merkel and Macron to back a 500 billion euro recovery fund to help the European Union's economy recover from the impact of the virus perfectly fits into this topic. Whatever it takes, Christoph Möller said in last week's talk that Germany is generally better in bureaucracy and, um, than it is in politics. This, he said, is one reason why we seem to be efficient in the fight against the pandemic within Germany, but are basically screwing up the European Union. This new proposed recovery fund could be the French-German attempt to unscrew the European Union, to be bolder in making EU politics. Or is it? Will it fail? Because Instantly, there was resistance from Austria, the Netherlands, Sweden, and Denmark, who prefer the money to be given out as loans instead of as grants. But before we get too deep into the topics, let me quickly introduce the fantastic panelists and their contributions so that we can get right into the debate. Our first panelist um, is currently not here yet. Um, he, he, he's supposed to talk about the lessons from the Ebola pandemic for the current crisis. Christos Stylianidis, I hope he will join us in an instant, is the former EU Commissioner for Humanitarian Aid and Crisis Management and currently a visiting professor at the IFHV. He will give his insights from his time as the EU's Ebola coordinator and addresses similarities and differences between Thank the two. You, I'm here. Oh, perfect. <laughs> welcome, Thank welcome. You. I'm, glad, I'm glad you're here. <laughs> perfect. Okay. I will continue my introduction and then you will start with your Thank you so much. Thank you. Perfect. So after uh, Chris Yossilianidis' contribution, we will turn to uh, the European institution that plays a special role, one could say, in this as well as the former crisis of the European Union. Mark Dawson and Anna Bobic um, will talk about the European Central Bank, the pan um, Pandemic Emergency Purchase Program, or short PEPP, as well as the recent and for some controversial decision by the German Constitutional Court. Mark Dawson is a professor of European Law and Governance at the Hertie School of Governance in Berlin. And Anna Bubic is a postdoctoral researcher at the Leviathan Project at the Hertie School Structural Law Center. Because the judgment of the German Constitutional Court is often discussed as a, a problematic incentive for some states to continue or even worsen the, their disregard for European institutions and especially the European Court of Justice, we will take a closer look at the EU's rogue states, as she will call them. Welcome Kim Len Schäppele, uh, uh, who is the Lawrence S. Rockefeller Professor for Sociology and International Affairs in the Woodrow Wilson School and the University Center for Human Values at Princeton University. She will discuss the increasing boldness of the rogue states in the EU during the pandemic, concentrating on Hungary and Poland. Last but certainly not least, Anna Katharina Mangold, Professor for European Law at the European University of Flensburg, will draw a wider picture and elaborate on how Corona exacerbates the ongoing fun uh, fundamental crises in the EU, namely the Euro and sovereign debt crisis, second, the refugee protection crisis, and third, the populism crisis. In her recent piece at, in, at Verfassungsblock, Anna Katharina observes that the Corona crisis is acting as a kind of catalyst for the EU's various crises, smoldering and burning for years and now intertwining with them. And one last thing before we really get started, let me remind the audience that you can participate by using the has hashtag IFHV on Twitter or on the comment sections of Verfassungsblock. 
So without further ado, Christos, you have the online floor. Uh, and you have to switch your microphone on. We don't hear you yet. That was okay. Yes, perfect. Yes. Okay. First of all, I would like to thank you for this uh, really kind invitation. It's an honor to participate in this uh, prestigious webinar to talk about uh, the European Union, especially at this critical time. You have already announced that this part of uh, the conference will be about the current COVID-19 uh, crisis, a crisis which is an existential challenge for the European project as a whole. Um, through my short intervention, I would like to relate the current crisis to my experience as EU Ebola coordinator 2014-2019 and as a, a former European commissioner in charge for crisis management. From these uh, two <laughs> uh, past experience, you can understand that I'm, I'm part of this crisis management team. Um, I will put on the table five critical questions. And I will try to provide initial answers to trigger the discussion on crisis management and health issues during emergency situations. Also, I would like to show how relevant it is to the relationship between European citizens and the EU, in particular, about their trust in the European institutions. I would like to clarify from the beginning, however, that despite the similarities, there are important differences between the Ebola crisis and the COVID-19 crisis, the current crisis. First, in the case of Ebola, through our common, and I underline common European response, we prevented a pandemic. COVID-19, on the other hand, has been declared by WHO as a pandemic. And my second point, the Ebola crisis, despite its sporadic cases affecting European citizens, was restricted mainly to Western Africa where it started. And at that time, we prevented a global health threat. Um, because of the limited time, I, I continue with my first question. My first question focuses about European solidarity. There is a painful debate, frankly speaking, whether or not there was a real European solidarity during the first phase of the crisis, especially towards the, most, the two most affected member states, Italy and Spain. My initial response, very correctly, the President of the Commission apologized for the lack of solidarity during the early days when we had, unfortunately, many victims, especially in North Italy. And also populist and Eurosceptics in Italy, but also in other European countries, are exploiting this to undermine the common European idea. From my experience as CEO Ebola coordinator, I can tell you that the common European response at that time worked successfully. We established the European Medical Corps and Medevac. We deployed European medical teams coming from different member states, Germany particularly, and all of them, they were together on the ground to defeat the virus on the three affected countries. I strongly believe this is the most successful outcome of this crisis management at that time. Second question, has the European Commission had the critical instruments to play its crucial coordinating role in an efficient and effective way or not on the health emergency front? My response, yes. There are, and these are Rescue and the ESI, in addition to the EU, European Medical Corps and Medevac. And I can say this from my experience as commissioner responsible for crisis management. Of course, there are other instruments 
in other fields like health. RescueU, you know about this, is an EU collective achievement during the mandate of the Juncker Commission, a real safety net to respond to extraordinary emergencies, not only for asylums, but also health emergencies. What we saw during the current crisis is that even though the virus knows no border, no borders, unfortunately, we focused on fragmented national responses. Of course, national responses are necessary, but the historical experience shows that the common European response as a complement to national actions is the most effective way to tackle an extraordinary crisis. My third question. One critical point that has been underlined, or let be underlined, by many pro-Europeans, like Guy Verhofstadt, MEP and former Prime Minister of Belgium, is the following. In such extraordinary emergency situations, regardless of the legal or legalistic framework, the Commission has the right of initiative. The ability and the duty to propose horizontal political initiatives based on the treaties in order to play its critical coordinating role. Is this correct? From the and others, uh, MEPs, my clear response, I believe G is correct. We expected political initiatives in order to have a collective European response. It's my strong belief that in extraordinary crisis, political initiatives that are allowed by the European treaties can overcome any legal obstacles. We have to recognize, of course, that the COVID-19 crisis has been overwhelming. And also we have to recognize that we were late in making a correct epidemiological analysis of the crisis. And this is why there are, there are some questions about the timing of the declaration by WHO of COVID-19 as a pandemic. It's a, it's a big debate, and you know this. I totally disagree with Trump administration, but it's a different uh, uh, debate. My fourth question. This is maybe the most important question and the most crucial. The populist and Eurosceptic argue that the structure and the nature of the European institutions are responsible for the EU's weaknesses and its inability to deal with the crisis in an efficient and effective way. Is the really the case? My response, definitely no. There are many successful cases where the current structure of the European Union as a political organization responded adequately in similar crises. I remind you again and again about the successful example of the Ebola crisis. B. If the structure and the nature of our union was the problem, we would have been unable to tackle the financial crisis and, of course, all the attacks on our common currency since its introduction. And my C point, regardless of any weaknesses of a union of 28, 27 member states, the resilience of the European project has been tested in, main, in major crises, like Brexit. If you compare the rate between Euro and, and uh, British pound sterling three years ago and now, I think this is a real evidence. So nobody underestimates the challenges of such unique structure, but the benefits and the value of this project for all European citizens is very evident. My last question. Last but not least, because of the perception that we were not able to tackle the health emergency phase of the crisis with a common European response, the question has now become, in case we do not manage to have an effective common European response on the economic front, will the European Union face an existential crisis? My response, yes, there is a risk. A real risk, but in order to avert the risk, we have to focus on three dimensions. 
first, we must face this crisis through the prism of the common European interest, because the single market, the single market is a unique achievement, it is a common achievement, and it represents and relies on the common European interest. And uh, I think the common announcement of Germany and France yesterday from uh, Angela Merkel and Emmanuel Macron um, is proceeding in this uh, way of thinking, in this, in, in this uh, dimension. My second point, at the same time, I agree completely with Chancellor Merkel that we should not leave anybody behind. And uh, I think Chancellor Merkel already underlined uh, yesterday in, in her uh, press conference very adequately and very um, vigilant. And my third point, we have to be bold in our political decision regarding the recovery fund and other mechanisms. At the same time, we must not ignore the historically established economic principle and of course the global competition. But I have to say that I'm very, I'm very optimistic and uh, I'm very confident after the announcement, yesterday announcement from um, Germany and France and this uh, no, uh, now restoring of the German friends axis, the most important pillar for the European process. Dear friends, our European Union has faced existential crisis during its long history, short history. We now have the experience, we have the knowledge, the European Union has proved its resilience. We know that we can continue only together. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, um, Christos, um, for your very valuable insight and especially for stressing so clearly the importance for European solidarity and a common approach to, to the crisis. I was told um, that I should explain one, once again where to use the hashtag um, to participate in this discussion for our audience. Uh, you can use it on Twitter. The hashtag is IHF, uh, IFHB, sorry. And you can also use it just underneath the stream. You stream it on the Verfassungsblog website and just underneath there's a commentary section that you could use um, and you don't even use to put in the hashtag obviously because we will read it under under the stream. So thanks, uh, thanks again, Christ, uh, Christos. Um, we will continue with um, Anna Bobic and Mark Dawson, um, who will turn to the two, uh, yeah, disputedly uh, discussed uh, actors of the crisis: the European Central Bank and the German Constitutional Court. You have the floor. Thank you. Uh, thank you and hi everyone. Thank you very much for having uh, me and Mark. Uh, I, in the half of the time allocated in the five minutes, I would like to actually go through what the central bank has done in previous crisis and in this one and how have the courts reacted. So where are we with the legal framework and what we actually need in practice. Um, so, I so the first a program of quantitative easing, which means uh, buying of governments, bo government bonds. The European Central Bank started with the outright monetary transactions back in 2013-14. Uh, and here the European Court of Justice had a, an opportunity to assess whether actually bond, a quantitative easing as a method of monetary policy is in line uh, with the treaties in the first place and the powers of the ECB under the monetary policy. Uh, after that, that, most recently, uh, the uh, European Central Bank has rolled out the public sector purchase program, uh, which has uh, the total volume of 2.5 trillion euros. Um, and this is precisely the program that has been at the center of the dispute between the Court of Justice in Luxembourg and the German Federal Constitutional Court, to which we will uh, get into a, in a minute. Um, but I would also very importantly like to, uh, like to stress the new 
newest already mentioned uh, the pandemic, the PEPP uh, program, which is slightly different from the previous one. But what is really important and what will really be at the center of this legal analysis is that uh, the criteria that the Court of Justice actually set out uh, for quantitative easing in its first decision have now slowly but surely been abandoned in subsequent uh, purchase programs of the European Central Bank, such as selectivity or connection to conditionality con uh, uh, attached to financial assistance programs, uh, as well as the duration uh, uh, of blackout periods for purchases and uh, maturity uh, periods uh, in terms of eligibility of government bonds. But now to move away from uh, the highly technical uh, uh, characteristics of the program, I would like to focus on two uh, points in the jurisprudence of the Court of Justice. And this is the independence of the, <clears throat> excuse me, of the European Central Bank and how the Court of Justice actually assesses the proportionality uh, of the use of its, uh, of its independence. And the second one is the prohibition of monetary financing. So how do we prevent member, uh, that member states stop following a sound budgetary policy, a policy if they are uh, aided by these purchase programs? So to start with independence and, and proportionality, the Court of Justice, of course, strongly emphasized ECB's broad discretion, uh, strongly emphasized its entire independence in comparison in in relation to setting the inflation rate which is uh, individually set by the central bank at right under two percent um, and of course the court of justice said that when the central bank assesses whether it acts within its mandate of monetary policy uh, it we have an effects analysis we should conduct an effects analysis whether the a decision in question achieves monetary or economic effects. Um, but the Court of Justice actually here introduces a, quite a narrow standard to say that any of these effects that should have been taken into account are only those that are foreseeable to the bank at the time. Um, and in this respect, the Court of Justice, when conducting a proportionality analysis, actually set quite a low bar for uh, the ECB because it only looked for a manifest error of assessment. And in this respect, it only uh, it accepted pretty much the information and the economic analysis that the European Central Bank conducted in relation to monetary policy effects. Uh, but as we will see later, uh, the, the Central Bank provided little to none economic analysis in addition to the, econo to the economic effects. So this would be in brief uh, the way that the Court of Justice analyzes the use of uh, ECB's mandate and its independence. And now moving on to the prohibition of monetary finance financing, uh, the Court of Justice, again, in, in relation to, uh, to this requirement in the treaty, um, set out certain standards that the European Central Bank should always meet, uh, such as the lack of certainty, so the governments are not supposed to know uh, which bonds will be bought exactly when and how long will they be held. Um, and as well as the maturity periods, there needs to be a strong link to conditionality and proportionality needs to be met. Um, but in, the, in relation to this 2.5 trillion program, a euro program, the Court of Justice found that the prohibition of monetary financing is not, not breached because the blackout periods are not disclosed in advance because there is some uncertainty left as to the uh, as to the way that the uh, central bank will buy bonds. But what is the most interesting thing about this is that, uh, as, I, as I introduced in the beginning, these have all been uh, uh, subsequently abandoned in the, in the pandemic purchase program. So now the purchases in the pandemic program are clearly set according to the capital key contributions to the European Central Bank budget. Uh, there is no reference to conditionality or the ESM. So um, it, we are kind of moving on to what I would, I would very much agree is a more European solidarity uh, in the sense of a more uh, targeted response, but very, very importantly, uh, in my opinion, the, the legal framework for now does not uh, allow this. And I will now move to Mark, uh, who will tell us more about the German federal court, uh, constitutional court's decision. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, so I'm essentially going to focus on the 
um, recent decision of the German Constitutional Court, but I'll focus on one very specific issue because we could talk about this decision forever. And I'm sure when it comes to the later discussion and comments, we'll go into different aspects. But really, I want to focus on one question, which is, well, what does that decision actually mean for the COVID-19 response? Um, and what does it mean for the PEPP in particular? Um, which is one of the quantitative easing programs, the most recent one that Anna mentions. Um, we're in the world of difficult abbreviations, abbreviations that are very similar to each other as well. So we had the PSPP, now we have the PEPP. Um, and essentially the PEPP, so the COVID-19 quantitative easing program, it's a little bit like a sort of greatest hits of the previous quantitative easing program, sort of combining different features of the previous um, programs. So in theory, um, it's universal. So it allows the purchase by the central bank of securities across different states, across different markets, not just government securities, but also corporate securities and so on. Um, but it's also a much more loose and much more discretionary um, quantitative easing program than some of the previous programs. So for example, in theory, the ECB is bound to the capital key subscription, the amount of subscription that national central banks make to the ECB. But in its decision on the new program, essentially the ECB said that it would be it would loosen these criteria. So it left open the possibility it would target its purchases at the states most affected by the COVID-19 outbreak. It also indicated that it would be much more loose in terms of the type of assets that would be bought under this program. So the ECB would be more open to buying less credit worth the assets, it would be more open to buying assets with a different um, time period in terms of their maturity. So it's a, it's a different program, um, a more expansive program in many ways than the previous PSPP program. That leaves the question then, is this type of program allowable under EU law? And is it allowable given the division of powers and competences between the European and the national levels? And of course, while the German Constitutional Court insisted in its judgment two weeks ago that it actually wasn't commenting on the PEPP, that, it, that nothing it said had any relevance for this program, of course what it said had huge relevance for this program in the sense that actually the part of the judgment that wasn't discussed at all really by scholars, which is the part that interpreted Article 123.1, which is the article that Anna has already mentioned, actually probably is the most relevant part of the judgment for the future of this PEP program and whether it's legal under EU law. So as Anna had mentioned, the decisive element here is whether the um, PEPP program and whether the previous PSPP program is compatible with Article 123 of the E-Treaty, which essentially prohibits the ECB from directly financing the budgets of the member states or assuming the debts of the member states. And in its earlier um, jurisprudence, some of which Anna mentioned, the Court of Justice had said that in order for quantitative easing to be compatible with that article, um, quantitative easing programs would have to meet certain safeguards. The problem is both that the German Constitutional Court in its most recent judgment, it interprets these safeguards as being binding standards that will also bind the ECB in respect to future quantitative easing programs. And the problem, of course, is that these safeguards don't look very good when you compare them against some of the features of the PEPP. So take, for example, one of the safeguards. One of the safeguards that the German Constitutional Court insists upon in its most recent ruling is that purchases under the PSPP were made in accordance with the capital key. And the argument of the German constitutional course is, is that the fact that these purchases were made according to the capital key indicate that this is more likely to be a monetary policy measure than some kind of disguised fiscal policy measure that actually benefits certain member states or poorer member states at the expense of member states with better fiscal outlooks. That was one of the safeguards that they took from the initial Gaivala judgment of the European Court of Justice and that they interpret as being binding also in the future. Another safeguard that they interpret as binding is that quantitative easing observes certain limits on the amount of asset purchases. So for example, they, they remark that the fact that the previous quantitative easing programs were limited to purchasing no more than 33% of all national government debt, they also interpret that as being a safeguard that implies that this could be a monetary policy measure and not a fiscal policy measure. They say the fact that there's this limits on the ability to purchase risky assets, that's another safeguard that they interpret as being binding. So here we have the difficulty the previous quantitative easing program was legal because these safeguards were somehow in place, 
But if we look at the new program, the new COVID-19 program, it's not clear that it actually meets these criteria. So if you interpret these criteria as being conditions of the legality of the new program according to EU law, then it seems that that program is in trouble from the outset. So that sort of brings into question whether actually this could be not sort of the end of the legal dispute between the Court of Justice and the German Constitutional Court, but actually the, the beginning of a whole new episode, right? So the German Constitutional Court, in a way, through its reasoning in this particular judgment, again, it's backed itself into a kind of corner, a corner that's been provoked by the nature of the rules governing European, monetary, Euro, European Economic and Monetary Union that might force it either to back away from this line of reasoning or to rule that a kind of crucial part of the COVID-19 response is illegal. In our view, sort of, that implies that we need to look again the rules surrounding EMU. Why do we have actually Article 123 in the first place? Why do we have such a narrow delimitation of the mandate of the European Central Bank? These are the reasons why courts are forced to engage in these sorts of confrontations with each other. But that's perhaps something that we can discuss a little bit later on so that I can keep since you're happy and remain within the 10 minutes we were allocated. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Anna and Mark, for, for this assessment. And I'm sure we will come back to this topic later in the discussion as yeah, one of the hot topics at the moment. Um, let's continue with Kim Lane Chapeler. Welcome again. You are an expert for the rule of law in the EU, uh, and especially in regard to the situation in Poland and Hungary. I'm looking much forward to your analysis um, about the EU's capabilities to respond effectively uh, to the increased boldness of rogue states, as, as you call them. Uh, during the pandemics. You have the floor. Thank you so much. And uh, I think, I hope that you can see uh, slides that I've just shared. Yeah. Um, so first of all, thank you so much for being included on this distinguished panel. And uh, I would like to start by, by saying that uh, as far as the EU goes, and oops, there we go. I think the biggest problem in the rule of law is not the German Federal Constitutional Court. What the German Federal Constitutional Court has done, I think, in this decision, and I agree with, uh, with Mark's analysis here, is to provoke a conversation about how to realize the basic principles of the European Union. It is not fundamentally a challenge to those basic principles of the European Union. So it's a question of interpretation. I think instead we have a much bigger problem <laughs> of the rule of law in the European Union, one that's been made worse by the pandemic. So this is a chart that was prepared by the Varieties of Democracy Project, and it sort of gives you a snapshot of what the real problem is with the rule of law in the EU. This is a chart that shows you along this uh, a horizontal axis the scores that, that various countries in the world received on this dimension of liberal democracy, which includes things like rule of law and the persistence of democratic institutions, as well as observing of rights. It's a pretty good index for the kind of thing we think of when we think of liberal democracy, along the horizontal axis is the score a country got in 2009, and along the vertical axis is the score a country got in 2019, and a country that didn't change is on the line, a country that got better is above the line, and a country that got worse is below the line. And one thing you can see is that the countries of the EU are all basically concentrated up here, but the real you know, disasters in the world, not just in the region, are Poland and Hungary, which have fallen from their liberal democracy scores of a decade ago by a really sharp amount. And it's not just a, qual a qualitative measure, but I mean, a quantitative measure, but it's also a qualitative measure. This is what Freedom House just put out very recently. And the crucial thing to see about this chart is, you know, Hungary goes down, Poland goes down. But here, these little lines here represent the Freedom House's assessment of when a country moves from one type of government to another. Consolidated democracies are the things you sort of had to be to get into the EU to begin with. A democracy where, as, as the founders of that term used to say, a democracy which is the only game in town. A semi-consolidated semi democracy is what you get when a democracy starts to waver on some of these commitments and you're not entirely sure that it's a fully fledged democracy. And then this last group down here, the transitional or hybrid regimes, also called competitive authoritarianism, is when countries are clearly no longer democratic. 
And what you'll see in 2020, this is the, the, bright, the latest Freedom House score, is that Poland has just dropped from a consolidated democracy to a semi-consolidated democracy. And Hungary, which has been steadily falling for the last decade, is now, according to Freedom House, no longer a democracy at all. So this was before the pandemic. What did the EU do to try to stop it? Well, Hungary, you know, in the case of Hungary, the commission brought some infringement actions that made absolutely no difference in the end, even when the commission won. The parliament passed multiple resolutions, including systemic ones that really took, it, took account of the whole complex of things that was happening in Hungary. Those resolutions changed very little. The European Parliament finally initiated an Article 7, Part 1 procedure in September of 2008. And remember, Article 7, 1 is the part of the Treaty of the European Union that just says we think there's a risk of a breach. It doesn't actually say that there's a breach. And that's bottled up at the General Affairs Council, which has not had a hearing on this question in months. Poland, uh, which ha actually happened much more quickly and in violation of its own domestic law, which made the Commission uh, feel a little bit on firmer ground to act. And also by this time, the commission understood what happened in Poland. Uh, the commission triggered the rule of law framework, which it had developed to deal with Hungary, but then never used. It did that in January, 2016. It's been bringing one infringement action after another. The ECJ has radically expanded its jurisdiction, particularly, or its jurisprudence, particularly with respect to judicial independence. The commission finally triggered an Article 7-1 procedure against Poland in December of 2017, and that too is bottled up at the council. So one of the lessons actually of all of this is that the member states don't discipline each other, and there's a limit to what the other groups can do, okay, that other institutions can do. So then the pandemic. All right, well, many EU countries have declared states of emergency and taken extraordinary measures. But the good thing about a pandemic, nothing much is good about a pandemic, but the one good thing about a pandemic is that what you have to do to deal with it is actually relatively clear. So the response needs to be medical, it needs to be responsive to how it is that the, that the disease in question spreads, and it may require some unusual measures. But in general in the EU, most countries have declared states of emergency but have not really instituted power grabs. Now in Poland and Hungary, since they were already really wounded democracies to begin with, the situation has been much worse. Now, in Poland, it's not so much that they've taken measures to deal with the pandemic or under the cover of the pandemic. In fact, if anything, the problem in Poland is that they did not declare a state of emergency. If they had declared a state of emergency, it would have allowed them to postpone in a regular and orderly fashion the presidential election that was originally scheduled for the 7th of May. But instead, the government tried to rig the election. So first they had, they had the idea that only voters at risk could vote by mail while everybody else had to go in person. And it turns out that the current government's base of support is in the over 65 group that would have been allowed to vote without risking their lives. And the opposition would have had to turn up and risk getting the virus to vote. But then under substantial criticism, the government simply postponed the election on the eve of the election and because it's not happening in a state of emergency, this is where the emergency law would have been more protective. There's literally no sense about when this election is going to be held. And the worry is that this gives the government time to fix the rules. In addition, in Poland, they've gone full steam ahead attacking judicial independence because they understand that when the commission is dealing with the kind of pressures that Christos mentioned, the commission has not been great at multitasking. And so, the Polish government has counted on the EU looking the other way and not paying attention. So the Polish government has moved ahead with disciplinary procedures against judges who have made references to the Court of Justice. And recently the government just replaced the president of the Supreme Court with a party loyalist in a, in a shall we say, a procedure that didn't follow the rules. The commission has finally, after a long delay, brought in interim, brought in interim measures action against this first, the continuing uh, disciplining of judges, but has been silent on the second. And you can see that a, a very aggressive commission has just failed to respond to the way it had been responding over the last several years. Now, the bigger problem is in Hungary. <laughs> Here, a state of emerg emergency has removed the last pretense of democratic government. And I, might, and I might add that that Freedom House judgment that Hungary had already fallen out of the community of democracies was made before this emergency was declared. It's gotten worse. 
So Viktor Orban, the prime minister, declared a state of emergency as an executive, as, you know, through an executive decree on 11th of March. He then put before the parliament uh, an, an emergency law, also called the Enabling Act, because of what it does. This law fundamentally allows Orban to override any law using his decree powers for the duration of the emergency. And his powers are unlimited, both in time, because the law doesn't foresee any particular end to the emergency, and subject matter. So his decree powers are not limited to things having to do with the pandemic. Okay? This Enabling Act also put into the criminal code two new permanent crimes that will not be affected by the end of an emergency if we in fact get one. The first punishes the distribution of false or distorted facts by up to five years in prison. And more than 100 people have already been arrested under these provisions, including last week, a couple of people who just put up Facebook posts critical of the government. There's also a new crime that punishes interference with the pandemic policies of the government. And there you can go to prison for up to eight years. Other governments have just put fines if you violate a curfew. This is a much more draconian um, measure. And of course, oh, this enabling act, sorry, I went ahead, um, just canceled all elections until further notice. Okay, so, and, um, and this is not alone. Part of the problem here is that under this enabling act, um, well, under the constitution, any emergency decree is supposed to expire after 15 days. And what the enabling act did was to give Orban the power to indefinitely renew his own decrees without consulting parliament, even though the constitution says, a decree must have parliamentary approval. This was kind of a blank check in advance. And also, given the way the law is written, Parliament cannot withdraw this delegation of power to Orban as long as the emergency lasts. And of course, as we've just as we've already said, Orban is the only one who can determine when the emergency ends. Okay, so this is a cover of one of the last remaining independent uh, publications in Hungary. You can see that basically everyone now realizes Orban runs everything in Hungary. You see this because there's been a militarization of everything. So one of the early decrees put military commanders at the top of every hospital. So every hospital now does not have a doctor in charge, but a member of the military. And as soon as this happened, the Orban government ordered that one half of all beds in the country should be made available for virus patients, which meant that between 10 and 30,000 people were evicted from their hospital beds, even though many were terminally or critically ill to make room for COVID patients. And there was an article in the FT this morning that, that interviewed one nurse who had 10 such patients who had been prematurely um, uh, discharged from the hospital. And she said nine of her 10 patients were now dead. This is not gonna add up in the COVID statistics. This is gonna be other deaths. In addition to this, military units have been stationed at 150 strategic companies to ensure their continued operation. And again, some brave interviewing by a local Hungarian investigative journalist said that basically these military units are making decisions about how the company operates. And more crucially, they are exfiltrating private data out of these companies, personal data about the employees, about the clients, and also intellectual property. What else? Well, this is where you start getting absolutely centrally into violations of EU law. The GDPR has been suspended in Hungary by decree for the duration of the emergency. In addition, all labor rights, including labor rights that, uh, that are in Hungarian law as the result of the transposition of EU directives, have also been suspended. And just one case so far, but you, now you see how it's done. At 10 a.m. in the morning, a couple of weeks ago on a Friday, Orban issued a decree that said the board of, that basically swapped out the board of directors of a publicly traded company and replaced them with his own friends. And he said this was necessary for the pandemic, but the company makes cardboard boxes and we're trying to figure out what that has to do with the pandemic, okay? So the government will say the constitutional court is still open. It can handle the constitutionality of cases, but those of you who've been following the Hungarian developments know that the constitutional court is still, it's been packed with Orban loyalists so no one expects it to go against him and ordinary courts are operating under some special emergency regulations. All right, so I'm almost done. So what has the EU done? Well, the EU parliament, which has always been the canary in the coal mine, shall we say, on trying to call out what's been happening in Hungary, the European parliament held an emergency debate last week on the emergency in Hungary. And many MEPs stood up and said, you know, it's time to cut funding, it's time to do something. This is appalling. 
And the person who holds the portfolio at the commission, Vera Yoreva, said that the commission is looking at this closely, but so far they had not detected any violations of EU law. It was clear actually from the statement she made at the very end of the hearing that she personally is really agonizing over this. She knows full well what's happening. And I think that she's being pulled back by her colleagues at the commission who were unwilling to do anything. So what if, what's, where are we now? So Commissioner Yorva hinted at a deal, basically saying the commission expects that all countries will phase out their emergency laws. She highlighted that it was the unlimited duration of the Hungarian emergency that has her particularly nervous. And she sort of hinted that if the government of Hungary phases out its emergency, all will be forgiven. And Orban has since hinted that the emergency will in fact come to an end in the next month or so, but the damage will have already been done. The government will have all private data of Hungarian citizens in its hands. The government has switched over the healthcare operation to the police and the interior ministry. And there've been a number of other permanent changes, including those two new crimes that will be totally unaffected if the emergency is ended and the commission has basically given up. So what, we can, what can we say about COVID in the EU? The COVID has masked the underlying rule of problems in the EU, which is to say the commission clearly doesn't care now as much about this as it cares about trying to solve the crisis and what we've seen before, because the same thing happened in the Euro crisis, you know, a decade ago when Orban first started consolidating his powers and the commission did very little is that the EU is not good at multitasking. And that means that this is not the end. Thank you. Thank you, Kim, for laying out that clearly, um, why we should be concerned about the Commission's uh, failure to act while aspiring autocrats are consolidating their control. Um, let us now take a step back and um, study the interconnectedness of the crises in the EU. Anna Katharina Mangold, you have the online floor. Thank you so much. Um, in the beginning of the pandemic crisis in early April, um, two, three weeks after it started in Germany, I wrote a short blog post that where I tried to connect the ongoing crisis to what Corona might do to them. And I think what we have heard just now just proves my point that I wrote that back then. So EU lawyers, and I'm one of them, have been worried a lot about the EU uh, for some years already. And I would tend to disagree with Christos Siljanidis. I think the current crisis or the multiplicity of crisis is something else. Being a European integration historian, I would say we always had some sort of crisis, but single crisis, not as many simultaneously. So we have been talking even before Corona about the Eurozone and sovereign debt crisis. We have mostly talked now, uh, or Anna and uh, Mark have talked about the legal side of things, but what this, what did that mean for the um, member states affect that the austerity measures were uh, really severe and uh, they disrupted the functioning of public health, for example, in the countries most affected. Uh, the refugee protection crisis that sometimes is, um, well, framed as a migration crisis, not at all. It's a question of whether the EU is uh, letting people die in the Mediterranean or whether it's uh, protecting their human rights. And we can see that this started to um, not find a European common approach, common answer, even before the pandemic crisis, but what has happened now. And finally, the populism crisis that goes with nationalist tendencies and, of course, a disrespect for the rule of law um, saw the UK leaving and many other member states not adhering to the very core values of the EU because the EU is a rule of law regime. It is not about sanctions. The member states cannot be sanctioned easily. They need to be... Um, convinced that the European project has a benefit that they want to continue to um, follow on. So all these current crises that have been severe even before Corona are much exacerbated currently. 
uh, with the economic recession, we see that the austerity mechanisms led to severely um, inflicting the ability of member states to respond to the crisis. I would argue it as has been no coincidence that Italy and Spain suffered so harshly from the crisis and Greece somehow managed to escape this by shutting down everything early on and arguably by infringing um, constitutional rights at the same time. Right? This has been argued in, in uh, Greek constitutional law. But um, public health specialists in Greece say that had the pandemic hit harder and had the government not taken harsher uh, precautions, it would have been a disaster because basically public health system is not working properly any longer in Greece. So, um, we have just heard about the public uh, the pandemic emergency purchase program. Uh, will this be allowed according to the German Federal Constitutional Court uh, ruling? I think that what we can see here is a um, the, the, the court, if we want to frame it very politely and positively, is arguing for a politicization of these debates. It wants the ECB to start talking about the political impact of their monetary policies. And this, I would argue, is something that we need. But at the same time, we see that the EU is, uh, well, um, seeing renationalization of member states approaches towards the EU. So to at the same time ask for a politicization on the EU level um, clashes with what we see on the EU level, namely that the Commission is much less inclined to open up political debate on the European sphere, uh, but really is very much dependent on the member states and the governments. And I think the example of Macron and Merkel just proves this point. It is the member states that are the driving forces just now. And these are single member states. It's not a, a joint effort of many member states, but these are, well, two of the founding member states. Um, I have not seen very much of the commission and certainly not much in terms of uh, bringing political questions to a political sphere in the EU as such and not on the member states level. So about the uh, refugee protection crisis, public awareness of course has slipped away from these problems. We do not read any longer about what's happening, even though people still die, people still try uh, to escape um, our, um, the really horrible conditions they're living in. And of course there is fewer money to spend on refugees. Um, we can see that there is always has been in these last years um, a strong national interest. Some member states want to protect refugees, others don't. There is no common response in the EU. And just now, um, just two days ago, the European Court of Justice handed down a judgment on the detention of refugees in Hungary, uh, where it said that they could be only um, held in detention for 28 days. Uh, this is not what is happening in Hungary. Indeed, since Corona started, since February, people are um, in the detention centers nobody is visiting them, no NGOs are allowed, and they are not allowed out. So even under the, this recent Court of Justice ruling, um, Hungary is breaking these laws and nobody is talking about it, right? That's what's happening because everybody is concerned with Corona. Finally, the populism crisis, as I would say, is a, of course it is a very complex um, phenomenon, populism. It is tied to nationalism. It is tied to an anti-democratic um, way of arguing because national populists know what the demos wants just like that without any elections they know it and uh, also there is a tendency to neglect scientific um, evidence or even sciences as, as such so what we can see is that uh, com conspiracy theories gain traction in many European countries and they are infused with right-wing nationalist populist movements um, that foster a distrust of governments, even in countries that are not 
on this have not been on the sliding scale before, uh, like Hungary and Poland. So, um, of course, the Corona crisis provides, as we have just heard, um, Hungary and Poland or Hungary mostly with emergency measures, but we have seen other EU member states answering with emergency measures. Um, we have covered this on FASMO's blog uh, uh, broadly, and it is really astonishing how, um, uh, how powerful governments become and um, parliaments lose. And um, so here we can see that once um, populist governments are established, they really gain attraction as in any crisis the, the executive wins to some extent so to somehow conclude to bring this together we have seen strong centrifugal tendencies even before corona corona has exacerbated these developments and most likely will strongly influence and continue to influence the setup in the eu um, looking into integration history, of course, there have been always crises, crises. but um, I am worried as to what extent this, this, these multiple intertwined crises will start to unravel the fabric of the EU and um, trying not to be too pessimistic in the end. I would um, argue that EU citizens need to seize the moment and fight uh, for a vision of Europe that is political. So we need more political debate. We do not need uh, bureaucratic uh, responses. And uh, certainly we do not need to overcome legal obstacles in a way that is centered on the executive. But we really need political debates and be very transparent and open about that. And um, we need to think about what the European integration project is about. Is it only an economic integration project? And I would argue it has never been, but it was a, well, uh, it was a co covert political integration project from the very beginning, but we need to be more open about that. But what is certainly missing is a social solidarity a response to what is going on. And I think if we do not come up with solutions to these questions that the pandemic poses in the, uh, the most ardent way we could think of, um, then I, I would think that what's the point of the EU, right? Why have it at all? So this is really what I think we are facing now. And on the positive side, the crisis is always also in a Greek drama is always the um, ha holds the possibility that things can change. And I would argue that we should try as EU citizens or as uh, those interested in upholding democracy um, to fight for this project. Thanks. Thank you, Katarina. Um, I think your call for solidarity rounds up perfectly um, this round of presentation as we started with the call for solidarity by Christos as well. Um, and it brings us to um, the next step of our uh, event, the interactive part. And I'd like to remind the audience that you can participate with the has hashtag IFHV on Twitter or in the comments section just below this live stream and we already have a couple of questions so we get right into it the first one uh, addresses all speakers i will just read it out loud uh, all the speakers seem to agree that an infringement action against germany following the recent ultra virus judgment by the bundesverfassungsgericht is a bad potentially dangerous idea do all speakers agree on this if so, in which way is it dangerous? Would it have effects on the way the union potentially handles the current pandemic or future crises? Who wants to address this topic first? Mark. Yeah, thanks. Um, so my answer would be yes, it's a very bad idea. <laughs> and actually I think it's generally a bad idea. So I think infringement actions against courts are, bad, are a bad idea in general which is why they're not very often used because you're raising an infringement action against the government, right? And then you're holding the government liable for something that an independent court is doing. So I think in general, 
that's a reason why we should kind of be reluctant to launch those types of actions. But here is a specific problem, which is who would actually decide whether the infringement action is valid? It would be the Court of Justice of the EU which is actually one of the parties in this conflict, right? We have precisely a conflict over the interpretation of EU law between the two courts. And then the party that decides whether that, you know, whether, whether the German courts ultra virus action sort of is valid or not is then one of the parties to the conflict. So I think that's not good. I think finally, just it's not good because we have to sort of somehow de-escalate this conflict and we have to shift the focus. So I very much agree with what Kim has said, what Katerina has said. The focus has to be on the design of EMU. The focus has to be on how we improve the way in which the economic and monetary union is working and not on a conflict between who has authority between the two different levels. I mean, there's a lot at stake in that conflict, but I think the main impetus now should be to think about how can we actually go forward? And how can we redesign the way the EMU works, including how the EMU works in relation to COVID-19? So I think an infringement action would be a distraction. It would damage the relationship between the two levels further. So um, in short, yeah, I think my position is, is pretty clear. Uh, I thought Kim and Katarina wanted to say something as well. First Kim, then Katarina. Yeah, just briefly. So I completely agree with that. I mean, I think you, you want to reserve infringement actions for actions by member state governments that violate not just the letter, but the spirit of the EU. And that's not the spirit of this German constitutional court judgment. And I think everyone's spending way too much time focusing on the ultra virus part of the decision and not enough time focusing on what the court clearly gives us kind of an exit ramp, right? The court is actually saying that the ECB, if it's going to be an independent institution under the treaties, needs to have an obligation of explaining what it's doing the same way that a court as an independent agency under the treaties needs to explain what it's doing. And so there has to be some accountability mechanism built in to every EU institution and the constitutional court is asking for that. So I, the EC, there's an obvious answer here, which is the ECP has to explain what it's doing and why it fulfills the conditions under which it operates. That's all the, I think that's, that would completely settle the problem and it would improve the EU and bringing an infringement action is exactly the kind of hubris that the Constitutional Court was trying to reject in the, EC, in the uh, ECJ's last decision on this. Um, also, from a more discourse uh, theory um, oriented approach, the arguments the Federal Constitutional Court brings to the floor won't go away. So the ECJ or the um, European Union can just force the uh, uh, Germany in, instead of the court to accept what they want to as, as the outcome. But I think the argument that indeed um, the monetary policy the uh, ECB has been um, implementing is very political and therefore needs a political response. This argument won't go away. And... Um, at the same time, I think it is really difficult for the other parts, the other par uh, branches of government in Germany to respond to what the court brought to them and on them. So here is uh, maybe a bit at least of a, um, um, well, an analytical way of thinking about it, that um, if the EU, um, uh, the European Court of Justice ruled against Germany, then at least the government could say, well, we cannot follow the FCC's ruling because we deem ourselves bound by EU law. But that is just another transposition of the essential conflict lying at the heart of this, uh, this um, dialogue that has been going on for, for decades, basically. Anna, you want to react? Uh, uh, turn on your microphone. Yes, sorry about that. Uh, I actually thought that after hearing everyone, I would have nothing more to say, but I would actually only add just one more thing, and I'm kind of a bit, uh, I thought Kim would pick up on this, uh, but uh, it does uh, stem from her distinction between what is a legitimate contestation of EU action and what is abuse of EU law. And I think I would just like to add a tiny detail, and that is that, of course, that the Pol uh, Polish government immediately picked up on, look at what the Bundesverfassungsgericht has done. Done, they've, uh, they've, they, they can do it so we can do it. And I think an, an infringement procedure would lend credibility 
that, that governments like Poland can abuse legitimate contestation for their ends. And now all of a sudden the commission will go around and pick up on every single one. Uh, this, the, the, what the court, Constitutional Court of Germany has done really is an, uh, another Zolange and I couldn't agree more with all the other contributors. So that was just a, a little addition for autocratic governments. Thank you. Kim, you want to add? Just one last PS, and this was, uh, so first of all, thank you, Anna, because we had this discussion sort of offline yesterday, but I just wanted one PS on Mark. So in general, I agree with him that this, this course of action where the, the commission can bring an infringement action against a member state for the action of its courts, that's always been controversial, but I think it should become less controversial in cases like Hungary and Poland, where the governments have operated to pack the courts with their own loyalists. And so as a result, those courts are acting precisely, they're the cover for the government. And I might say that just to respond to what Katarina was saying, that the Hungarian courts have been terrible on migration, coming right up against EU law. There's literally a decision of the Constitutional Court from two years ago that the Commission said nothing about, that basically said that when a refugee was denied an asylum claim in Hungary, they immediately became an illegally resident person. And first of all, the lawyers who assisted them could be criminally prosecuted for human trafficking, and that the person who was denied the right of asylum had no right to have rights under the Hungarian constitution. If the commission said nothing about that court decision, I don't see how they can say anything about the ECJ judgment, about the federal constitutional court judgment. Uh, I have another question um, concerning the topic of Hungary again and the EU's capability to respond. Um, so it goes uh, to Kim. Um, it was suggested today on Verfassungsblock, the question goes from Twitter, that Hungary should be excluded from the European Council and the Council of the EU as uh, it, its government ceased to be democratically accountable. What do you think of this suggestion, Kim? Yeah, I thought that was brilliant, actually. And in fact, I, I work with a group of people who are thinking about this issue and we all traded emails this morning saying, that was brilliant, why didn't we think of it? So let me just say one thing about why that's so brilliant. So one thing that's gonna be coming up, and we've just started to focus on this now, is that in the second half of 2024, Hungary is supposed to take the rotating presidency of the EU, followed immediately by Poland in the first half of 2025 taking the rotating presidency of the EU. If Hungary and Poland continue down this road and we don't see any way that they're gonna be deterred, can we really have the rotating presidency be in the hands of these rogue states? So one reason why I think this, this you know, Article 10 um, TEU solution is so brilliant is that among other things, it would provide a solution to that problem, right? Which is to say, by excluding Hungary and Poland from the council on that ground, it would also solve the rotating presidency problem, which I think we have to get ahead of and think about. But it's a, it's a really, it's just brand new. We have to sort of think it through, but I thought it was brilliant. Okay, feel free if you have comments to just interrupt. If not, I will continue with the questions from the audience. Um, I don't know where this is from. I will just read it out. It has been argued that the federal constitutional court's judgment could, in the best case scenario, lead to a transformation of the EU for the better. Can we perhaps already see the beginning of such transformation now that Germany, together with France, has come up with the idea that would arguably make the member states' commitment of solidarity much more real? In other words, could the initi uh, initiative partly be understood as an attempt to control the potential damage resulting from the judgment? I think this goes to everyone. Uh, Anna, yeah? Thank you. I think that's an excellent question. And uh, I think we kind of tried to hint at, uh, or at least tried to hint at this in the beginning. Absolutely. I think that uh, uh, the German government uh, is now finding itself really in a position where obviously radical movement the radical progressive change is necessary and i and i mean it, it i think it will be hard to get member other member states on board um but the way that the recovery fund itself has been designed the fact that it's not a loan it's a grant the fact that we've moved away from conditionality i think 
only these, I mean, this is a very temporary measure and it's, it's in a very specific context, but I do think that it shows us that we can move away from the prohibition of monetary financing and we can move away from uh, regarding all the members of the Euro, Euro area and the European Union as individual units, but rather as a, you know, this is a, a shared project with sharing uh, of risks. That's, that would be my answer. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Kim and then Mark. Well, yeah, so I, I also think that this probably wouldn't have been possible, this fund, without the decision of the Federal Constitutional Court. It was exactly the pressure on Germany to do exactly what Katarina suggested, which is to politicize the problem or to make it more an overt political solidarity move where the German government is actually willing to pay. And it also sort of shows why the German government has been so resistant to these bond buying programs. And that's, that's a lot because the German government doesn't want an unlimited commitment. And I think what it's completely comfortable with is solidarity, but with limits. And this program sets sort of an alternative framework up that both, you know, makes the German federal constitutional court, it pushed them into this political solution. And I think that's fabulous for the EU and it's good for Germany that it stood up to doing that. Mark and Christos? Yeah, I mean, I agree completely with what Kim has said. I mean, I think the truth is that Germany has been hiding behind the ECB, right? And the ECB has been carrying out all sorts of additional functions that normally would be expected sort of a fiscal institutions or fiscal institutions to carry out. And of course, that's part of a traditional strategy in European integration, whereby the EU sort of depoliticizes things. It integrates by hell, stealth, sort of hides what it's doing. But ultimately, there are costs associated with that. And one of the costs is that you don't explain to your domestic public what is actually necessary in order to keep this project of European integration going, right? Now we're in a good moment. You know, we have a chancellor in this country who's extremely popular. She doesn't, you know, she doesn't have any elections left that she needs to win. <laughs> she has political capital to spend. Why not spend it on this, which is something which could potentially could have a positive long-term legacy. So I agree with Kim, you know, maybe the German Constitutional Court didn't know that this would happen. Um, but it might be a positive side effect of its ruling. This does. Thank you. I would like to turn a little bit of discussion out of the legal framework. Um, I'm not uh, coming from a law uh, background. I'm a medical doctor. I'm very practical in my life, frankly speaking. And um, I completely agree with Katarina that uh, what we need now in Europe is to focus on a political debate and to put on the table, especially against populist and Eurosceptic, political arguments and practical solutions. And of course, I completely agree with all participants uh, about the rule of law in Poland, in Hungary. Uh, definitely, Kim, I uh, uh, stand with you on this. But now and yesterday, regardless of the, of the decision of the, of the court in Germany, we had a major step about Europe. The announcement yesterday by Emmanuel Macron and Merkel regarding the recovery fund is so big step in order to show to the ordinary people everywhere across Europe that Europe remains strong in decisive steps. And I'm sure it will be a turning point in this very really demanding period. And um, as I saw, at least from South, Greece, Italy, Croatia, Spain, Portugal, because um, in the morning I had a lot of calls with all, uh, uh, with many friends and many politicians from these uh, uh, countries. They welcome this step as uh, something similar to the, to the foundation of the Euro. So it's not about only the multinization 
of the of the death because sometimes um some people especially the eurosceptics uh, they they use the solidarity as a as a sort of meaning of the breakup no we talk about our common interest and this is why i focus on my intervention about common interest about common response this is what we need to show to the people in order to understand that the european union is not only ties is not only papers is not only bureaucracy in brussels but is something very practical close to the ordinary people with solution i remember and sorry no complacency about this achievement rescue you when we managed two years ago in sweden the first uh, so devastating forest fires in sweden you can imagine <laughs> because of the climate change of course when we manage to provide assistance at the swedish people i remember i was there and the swedish people in many villages they 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 went out of their homes of their houses with a european flag i saw the same i saw the, the, the same picture in greece in portugal and everywhere of course we had the devastating forest fires in portugal 3 years ago and we apologized and i remember an excellent expression by juncker that the european union is not just to say condolences to the people but to be there when they need it when they need the european institution so i think we have to of course uh, uh, it's your job to make this debate in a, in a, in a very uh, low field but at the same time especially in this very demanding period because of the pandemic we have to focus on the big picture and to talk about politics to talk about practical solution to talk about common interest and to talk about when and where we can proceed together in order to rebuild why not some weaknesses of our european institution mm -hmm. thank you thank you um just just a little side note we could see you better if you put your camera a little bit up because we see your face only okay. <laughs> yeah, perfect. Okay. Perfect. Perfect. Uh, Karina, you wanted to, add... <laughs> to, say my, to tell my truth. <laughs> Katarina, you wanted to add something, and afterwards, I would like to ask another question to Kustas that goes kind of in the same direction. Yeah, even though I, of course, welcome this positive uh, framing of the um, Macron and Merkel um, recovery fund uh, proposal, and I think that to um, liken it to a Schumann moment in European integration history, it just uh, proves again my point. It's the member states that provide the answers these days. And these are just two member states out of 27. And we'll address, we will see how this works out. And I'm not sure whether this is my vision of political debate that just two important and economically strong member states take a step forward, uh, whether this is what I would like to see. I personally think that it would be so much more convincing to frame this as a common European approach if the, the European institution had some say in it, especially the European Parliament and uh, possibly even the Commission. And um, I think this just serves my point that we can see a severe erosion of political power of the Commission being taken away by the governments of these member states. Yeah, Christos, you want to react? Yeah, sure. A uh, uh, few words. Uh, definitely, I, I totally agree with Katarina. And uh, of course, uh, um, it would be the best if we had uh, um, similar reaction by the European Union, by the European, uh, by the European Parliament, by the European Commission. But uh, as we know from the ancient Greek uh, period, 
the famous proverb, um, at least now we had this uh, initiative by the two big countries, French, uh, German, Axis, the most important pillar of our European cohesion. And in uh, such times, um, the enemy of the good is the perfect. Of course, I agree with you, but at least we had this announcement and we have to utilize this in order to go forward. Um, yeah, maybe in, in, in the same line of this um, topic, the question is from Verfassungsblock, I think, um, and it goes to Christos, as I mentioned. Surely you have dealt with many crises in your function as EU Commissioner of Crisis Management. Sometimes in the past, the EU has been weakened by crisis, but sometimes Overcoming a crisis can also strengthen the community like the EU. I think Ms. Mangold hinted to that earlier. What factors, in your experience, determine whether the union comes out of, uh, comes out of them stronger or weaker than before? Will the EU be stronger or weaker after COVID? I have to say that uh... I expected really more common European response in the crisis management field and also in the health field in the first phase of this crisis. But if we, if we can find some critical instruments, results oriented to the financial crisis, which already followed the emergency situation, I think European Union will be in a better position in the near future. And this is why I, I, I highlighted this uh, announcement yesterday from Merkel and Macron, because for me, it's really turning point in our uh, um, uh, European uh, history. And um, I think uh, even Brexit would be really a turning point for us. Um, I'm coming from a, a small country, a former British colony, and I know well, I study in London, and uh, I, I never believed that the British people they, they, they made the decision to leave the European Union, but they decided. And now, even during pandemic, we saw that many European countries, the vast majority of the European countries, I can say few of them, Germany, Greece, Croatia, Denmark, uh, uh, Netherlands, uh, even France, they, they managed to handle this very crucial issue about COVID-19 better than the British approach. And of course, this, um, in front of the eyes of the, of the ordinary people, there is a comparison. Why we had these results and why in UK, they have these results. So everything in our times is uh, comparable. And uh, I think after such crisis, Brexit, refugees, migration crisis, I totally agree with Katarina. We failed at that time to manage in a very appropriate way the refugee crisis, but at least we, we kept our cohesion with uh, some real wounds because of, of a uh, urban approach against uh, Poland and so on. But in the last years, we faced with Brexit, we faced with uh, uh, migration and refugee crisis we face with the uh, new influence of the um, far-right parties. We face with 
climate migration, which were against European Union as a concept, frankly speaking. He knows better than me that one of the major arguments of Trump uh, uh, campaign was against European Union. Yes, I'm correct, Kim. Yes, so we, we had all these crises during the last five years, and we saw that, except Italy, in, in, in Germany, for example, AFD didn't increase its influence more than what we expected. So my conclusion is very clear. The European Union, regardless of its weaknesses, until now in many crises, has shown real resilience. And I think even now, after this pandemic, after all these crises with rule of law in Poland, in, uh, in Hungary, and many other crises, we already created real common interest even among ordinary people. And this is, for me, the most important foundation to go beyond. And when we see such very decisive step as the yesterday announcement, from Macron and Merkel, I'm really optimistic. I would like to see the glass, instead of half uh, uh, less, half uh, full. Thank you so much. Thank you. I have another question for Kim. Do you observe issues of rule of law under a state of emergency in outside of EU other than Hungary? If so, do you think is the Hungarian case more serious than other states? If not, do you think is the comparatively low level uh, of rule of law before the pandemic triggered the serious issue of rule of law in Hungary? I would like to know the, whether COVID-19's influence on rule of law in Hungary and other states is similar or different. Yeah, so, so first of all, the, uh, the Fassens blog, uh, an extensive series on emergency measures in lots of countries is really the best source that I know of. Um, and I think one of the things you see in reading all those uh, accounts is that it's really quite different in different places. And there are some places where the state of emergency has forced governments to kind of shape up. Because when you have something like a pandemic, it's very hard to hide. It's the kind of thing a government can't spin. And so people can tell whether a government's being effective or not. And I think that's actually reined in um, some leaders, for example, like Bolsonaro in, in Brazil or even Trump in the US their popularity has fallen because it's really clear that they've just messed up, you know? And so it's, it's a lot, these are kinds of crises where effectiveness is something people can see. Um, in other places though, you do see some emergency powers coming in under guise of the pandemic that we're really worried about. So I think India is a case um, that I would watch. Um, you know, that's, that's really been on my mind. Israel looked really dire, still doesn't look great, but it pulled back from a real abyss. And so, I think, I think the general thing you can say about emergency powers is that they're, they allow a government to cast off the normal. And in some cases, their normal was terrible, and this gives them an opportunity to get a little bit better, and in other cases, worse. Um, I think what's really, the part that surprised me the most, though, is the part I mentioned with both Poland and I think the US. And that is that occasionally you can find abuse in the failure to invoke emergency powers. So there were a lot of emergency powers available to Donald Trump here at the beginning of the pandemic, and he simply refused to invoke them. And he just like a, allowed this kind of competition among state governors to go forward, sort of as if it was some kind of carnival in which, you know, watching, watching them scramble for, you know, various forms of scarce medical supplies was kind of a sport. And in Poland, like I said, if they had been able to invoke the state of emergency in their laws, it would have allowed a regularized postponement of the election, which would make everybody know where they stood. But because they refused to invoke the emergency provisions, even though there was an actual emergency, now the election is just in limbo. So I think for those of us who study states of emergency, what this has really put on our academic agendas is A, the idea that they don't all pull in one direction, but B, the idea that the failure to invoke emergency powers can itself be a problem if you have an actually existing emergency like this. Mark? 
Yeah, this is this is not actually an answer to to the questions. I have to apologize for that, but sort of something I was thinking about when Kim spoke, which is, what about emergency powers at the European level? So, I mean, what I think is really interesting is that basically we have widespread flouting of EU law all over the place, borders being closed left, right, and center, um, asylum. We haven't discussed that asylum law being violated left, right, and center. All sorts of EU law provisions being violated. And somehow we have the, the central actors like the European Commission and so on, they don't care. They just sort of turn a blind eye. And I think that's because there isn't any regulation of that at the European level. So this links a little bit back to what was discussed in last week's panel on the German constitutional framework, where you know, there was a discussion about whether the German constitution has enough in it to deal with emergency situations and to limit the use of emergencies. Um, but in the European framework, it's even worse. You know, it's not regulated at all. And thereby, sort of the risk that we see at the national level of the emergency sort of overstaying its welcome, you know, it's really present, I think, on the European level as well. Sorry for that, just addendum. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's very interesting. Katharina and then Kim again. Thanks, Mark. I totally agree. And I tried to allude to this that the Commission is missing as a political actor here. And uh, what we have seen is that most the economic freedoms that are called fundamental freedoms in the EU um, are curtailed, are infringed, but this is justified by public health. And public health is one of the reasons that can justify uh, infringements of the economic freedoms. But this again brings down the EU to just an economic integration project, right? So if we read the competencies of the EU, there is a clear public health supportive role uh, that the Commission just would need to seize and here I want to add another argument. This commission under Ursula von der Leyen is especially weak because she is not the president that the European people elected by way of the um, Spitzenkandidaten process, the lead candidate process, but really she was appointed by the member states. Therefore, she derives her uh, political power from the member states and has no uh, political power as, of her own as um, um, as uh, we have seen in the previous more political commission, uh, where there was at least the attempt to bring on some political debate about uh, political measures and policy choices of the commission. So I would say that uh, the ongoing crisis that we have seen before, where we already saw a weakening of the uh, EU institutions, especially commission, uh, and the um, strengthening of the member states can be clearly seen in the role of the Commission as such. Thank you, Kim. Yeah, and just to add to this, because I think it's a really fascinating topic for this emergency. What we've seen is that the Commission responds by relaxing rules it would otherwise enforce. So the state aid rules, the fiscal targets, and basically they're, they're in, they're, they have emergency powers through announcing in their prosecutorial discretion that they will not prosecute, which is not a very nice way to do emergency powers. The other way the EU tends to do it, and we saw this much more in the financial crisis of 10 years ago than now, is that the member states just run around the edge of the European you know, institutions and they develop fiscal compact on their own. And we saw that with the Austrian sanctions you know, when the Freedom Party first went into government. So those are the two ways the EU tends to have done it. And neither one of them is a particularly rule of law-ish solution within the law itself. They both sort of say we're standing outside the framework in order to be able to deal with this. And it would be great if out of this came some actually regularized emergency powers. Uh, I have another question regarding yesterday's proposal. Merkel and Macron's proposal is an agreement on market-based solidarity. A European social solidarity must involve other interlocutors than finance and economy ministers. The social partners, in particular trade unions, local actors from the health sectors, etc. How can these actors be involved in the debate? What role can the Commission play to broaden the debate on market-based solidarity to a debate on social policy solidarity in the EU? This goes to everyone. Anna? Thank you. Um, 
I mean, I, I raised my hand because I'm working on issues on solidarity in, finance, in the EMU, and uh, I think this is an extremely interesting question, but at the same time, the only way that I could respond to it is uh, with I don't know, in the sense of, uh, you know, 10.2 today was brought up in the context of Hungary, but I think that Article 10.2 you generally gives us so much leeway for uh, participatory democracy mechanisms, and the EU Commission is, uh, in fact, I mean, there are some programs of holding EU debates and what and so on, but I'm not quite sure that any of those are used uh, to their full potential. Um, whereas the social dialogue and the social charter has been expanding for some time. For some time, I feel like until we really start talking about um, not only uh, harmonizing the generation of income, but also the redistribution of income. Uh, on the EU level, that's kind of, I think, where where we need to where, where we need to look, and I and and that's why I mentioned the recovery fund being such a big step in this direction. Again, not solely for its current short time effects, but really about the conversation that we're having and the relationship between the different levels of government that we're uh, that we're talking about in this moment. So, in, in my mind. Um, I think that we this is this provides just such a perfect opportunity to explore different mechanisms that treaty law gives us in this respect, but also to explore the willingness, the political willingness uh, of the current uh, climate to really think uh, think this further. But at the same time, uh, it's really necessary to kind of move away from the discourse of solidarity as as free money, as solidarity as gifts. And because, for example, I was reading a report, the most recent report on uh, the Greek ESM um, um, macroeconomic adjustment program, and the introduction says, "Oh, this was the largest single." transfer of solidarity in the European Union. That's, that's not how loans work. Loans are not uh, uh, expressions of solidarity. And to finish off, I have just actually a question uh, to end with for uh, Christos in this respect, because uh, he keeps, you keep mentioning the common interest. And really, solidarity actions always need to be uh, 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 performed in common interest. But I, and and pre precisely because you uh, uh, are not a lawyer, my really my biggest question would be: How do we define the common interest, and what is this common interest that uh, we are now seeing arising, or or we are creating a European solidarity based on what common interest? Thank you. Uh, sorry, Mark. And oh no, Christos wants to react, and then Mark, please. Really, very controversial issue to define uh, the common interest. Um, I try to frame with uh, some. Uh, um, critical sentences uh, just to find common ground with your approach about solidarity. First of all, I don't, I don't think that solidarity and common interest, they are, they, they are a sort of contradiction. I, I think it's a, they, they have a complementarity. Why not? Yes. Um, second point, I think that uh, when we talk about single market in Europe, and uh, of course uh, through single market, um, we we established uh, some uh, privilege to the European product. This is. Uh, really something which will benefit the common interest. Because when in Greece or in Cyprus, in Italy, the people, they want to buy um, golf instead of Japanese cars or other cars outside of Europe, 
this action really offered more jobs in Germany. At the same time, if some parts of the golf industry, they will produce in some small SMEs business in Italy and in, and in Greece through some European funding and through um, common European projects with universities, one university is from Munich who, with Thessaloniki and uh, in, uh, in Rome. So all these things in real terms creates common interest. So I strongly believe that the single market is a, is a, is a very fertile ground for this common interest. So we have to protect the single market because it's a common achievement and through this uh, Merkel Macron initiative, we can see more activities in order to protect, to defend and to extend the single market as a real vehicle for our common interest. I, I try to, to frame common interest through very practical, everyday uh, things. Thank you. Mark, Kim and Katerina, before we go to our last question. Yeah, just very briefly, because the question was about also social actors. I think one of the main lessons here is let's, we should be very grateful that we're not doing the ESM, the European Stability Mechanism. And if you want to talk about, you know, accountability, involvement of trade unions, social actors, civil society, they had no role in the ESM whatsoever. So we don't know the design of this new fund, but the more the design is managed through the ordinary legislative process, which is still something that has to be fought over, and the more you know, social actors and a diversity of voices are likely to be represented. So, so how this proposal is translated into EU law matters, but it looks like it's not going to be translated into this ESM model, and that's something we should be we should be thankful for. Kim? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this is where we might have a little silver lining on the rogue state problem. So there has been a, a mechanism of social solidarity in the EU, and it's called the European Structural and Investment Funds. And the thought was that you equalize countries, and then they are supposed to equalize within their own countries the problems that social policy is designed to, to solve. The problem that we now have with the rogue states is that the rogue states, particularly Hungary, has been routinely implicated, shall we say, in quite high-level corruption. Hungary and Poland are two of the only states, I think there's one other, that has not signed on to the European Public Prosecutor's Office. Um, the misuse of European funds through the European Structural Investment Funds is well known in these countries. And so you're starting to hear around the edges now, how can the EU channel money to these rogue states without going through the government? So there have been proposals mooted in the European Parliament to channel funds directly to NGOs or, or around the national government to the local governments. As long as we're having that conversation, it seems to me that it opens up exactly this social question about how it is that the EU can channel money inside states without going through states. And the rogue states may give us a chance to mention that. One other thing, because I like to have silver linings on bad, on dark clouds, Brexit may also, much as I wouldn't wish this on any of my British friends, now that it's gonna happen, one of the things that that does is it removes the British veto on a lot of social policy, which has been there from the beginning and has really been one of the reasons why we don't have a more robust social policy in the EU. Removal of the British veto may actually open up the possibility for thinking about own resources, which has also come up in this debate a lot. As long as this is not direct transfers where you can tell that Germany is subsidizing Greece, for example, the, the member states may be more open to social redistribution based on own resources. So I see both Brexit and the rogue state problem as opening up sort of new horizons for thinking that weren't possible before. And maybe that will be the best legacy of this entire mess. I just want to point out uh, one observation in Christos' answer. 
I think uh, the common and traditional way to go about crisis is to uh, rely on the economic integration of single market as a default option. That's what the EU is about and it will bring prosperity and it will foster democracies eventually. However, I think that the rogue states and the state, states are a case in point that prove that this is not the case. We can think about economic prosperity distinctly and not connected with democratization and uh, adherence to the rule of law. And I think here we can also see that this specific um, concept of economic integration that is enshrined in the EU at least since the late 80s when there was a change from the order liberal to the more Chicago school way of thinking about economic uh, policies, um, I would argue um, th that this disconnect hasn't been thought properly through in the European com uh, con institutions. And I think that's where we need to go about. Economic prosperity is not the only thing that helps us uh, foster the European integration project. So the answer cannot be the single market. Uh, one last question, and I would ask our panelists to answer in one sentence. Um, for Verfassungsblock, could all panelists name one thing that they think will be fundamentally different in the EU after COVID-19? Maybe we start with, um, I don't know, maybe raise your hand. Christoph? Excuse me, I, I could not hear the, the, the question. Um, the question is, could all panelists uh, name one thing that they think will be fundamentally different after COVID-19 in the European Union? And um, maybe you could answer in one question, uh, in one uh, sentence. Yes, I, I think we will see uh, more funding for the healthcare systems across Europe. There is a, a horizontal agreement, I think even for a very neoliberal approach to where more or less again, uh, national health care systems, especially in South. Now, um, they realize that in such extraordinary emergency situations, we need national, we need sufficient national health care system. And this is, I think we saw also in New York, in, in, in the USA. And this is why as a politician, I was always a supporter of Obama reform regarding the national healthcare system in the USA. So um, this is my, my clear answer. We will see um, very important funding going to, um, to improve the national health care systems. Thank you very much, Katarina. I think what this uh, crisis shows is that there is no unpolitical decision making, not in healthcare, not in virology, not epidemiology, uh, not in economic spending of mon money and monetary policy. It's all deeply political and therefore we need to discuss it uh, politically. And I think this insight won't go away, or at least that is my silver lining. Uh, thank you. Is next, Kim, please. Yes, yeah, so this is sort of follows on that, which is to say, I think that what Europe has seen is that it needs different forms of solidarity. That whenever you get something like this, which crosses national boundaries, the EU has got to have some competence and some big role in coordination. And once the EU starts to move into the area of health, it's a short distance from there to other forms of social solidarity. And once you have both the rogue state problem and Brexit, a lot of the reasons for having social solidarity emerge and a lot of the barriers to social solidarity disappear. Thank you, Mark. I have a minute. Mark, do you want to add something? Is it frozen? Maybe you Yeah, we make solidarity. Ah, now. Sorry, can, can you hear me? Now we can hear you, please. The, the best, case, best case scenario, we remove conditionality from the lexicon of European law. 
worst case scenario, borders are back in the European Union based on the health immunity of the population. We hear you very bad, Mark. Are you still there? Um, so <laughs> Maybe we can discuss. Oh no. Okay. Um, and maybe Mark fixes his connection and you go last because we couldn't hear the last part of what you were saying. So I'll give Anna the floor and you have the last word. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, which is a bit, un a bit unfair because uh, I kind of uh, went in the similar direction. I, I, my, you know, the question was one thing that will be fundamentally different and the one thing that I circled around, I mean, of course, it goes in line with all the other answers. I, I circled mutualization of debt and risk sharing. I mean, it's a very narrow financial uh, uh, wish, uh, such as Mark's no conditionality, but really I think that's a crucial shift. Uh, and it really ties into what Kim was saying, that we, we simply understand the, the, the risk sharing nature of the project on every level, not just a financial health uh, risk sharing, every sort of risk sharing. It's just, I, I, I would not move to this federalism camp uh, that is uh, moving towards full harm, you know, any harmonization is good harmonization, any integration is good integration, uh, there needs to be a clear hierarchy, no, but definitely an understanding that this is a common shared project. Yeah, thank you. So Mark, should we try it again? <laughs> I cannot hear you. Maybe if Mark turns off his camera, he'd get better. I think Anna time. said what I wanted to say, so we can leave the last word with, with her. <laughs> All can right. you hear me now? Yes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I think Anna already said what I wanted to say, so I can leave the last word with, with her. Okay. Thank All you. right. Okay, um, that brings us to the end of the discussion. I don't see any handwriting in my Zoom um, settings here. Um, I want to thank Pia Thielberger uh, and Mark Steinbeis for organizing this live debate. And obviously, I want to thank the panelists um, who gave brilliant, excellent uh, presentations today. I think we all learned something. Um, and I want to remind that next week's debate on May 26 will be about universally respected but temporarily neglected COVID-19 as a crisis for human rights and multilateralism. So it leaves me to say take care, stay healthy and thanks again for, for, for joining here and uh, giving us your insights. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Yes, thanks very much. Bye, everyone. Bye. <laughs>